My name is Dr. Stephen Scultetti, and I'm a member of the faculty at the University of Mississippi, where I serve as director of the Declaration of Independence Center for the Study of American Freedom. The mission of the Declaration Center is to ensure that faculty, students, and community members across the state of Mississippi have an opportunity to study the nature of American freedom. The center is operationalizing this mission in a number of ways. It currently supports an academic minor in freedom studies, and it's also working to link talented students to opportunities like internships, fellowships, and scholarships. The Declaration Center supports faculty research, and the Declaration Center also puts on a number of public events. We were thrilled to be able to organize the following event, which features Dr. Craig Bruce Smith. Dr. Smith earned his doctorate at Brandeis University, and he currently serves as an associate professor of history at the National Defense University in the Joint Advanced Warfighting School. This event was also made possible by the Jack Miller Center for Teaching America's Founding Principles and History. We hope you enjoy this event as much as we did. So, uh, one thing I have to say, because I work for the federal government, all views of my own do not represent those of the U.S. federal government, the Department of Defense, or Tom Cruise. Uh, so, greatest man in the world. Um, we're going to talk about where this comes from. Before that, I want to talk about this. George Washington has monuments. We know that. He's got a really big one in Washington, D.C. The question I'm going to ask you is, where in the world, not Carmen San Diego, I've just aged myself, but where in the world is the first monument to George Washington? It is put up in 1778 during the actual war. Ireland, you may know, has a complicated history with, with, with England. Um, it's put up in 1778 by Edward uh, Newmanham, who is an Irish politician. And it's dedicated to Washington, who he calls the greatest ornament of this century. So you could find it still today. It's kind of in ruin, ruin a little bit. Um, it's about five miles from the Dublin airport. So if, if you're flying to Dublin and you have a longer layover, go see the first monument to George Washington. Now, why does this matter? Well, one, it shows that Washington's being recognized during his lifetime. He's being recognized during the war. He's being recognized in the United Kingdom. But more than that, Newmanham has got a inscription on it. And the dedication is talking about, oh, ill-fated Britain. What he's doing is taking Washington, the symbol of Washington, the image of Washington, the name of Washington, and grafting it on to an Irish nationalist movement, to a movement for the liberty and freedom of Ireland. And so what I want to do tonight is invite you to follow me on a worldwide journey to find George Washington. And I'm here to tell you, you can find him on every continent in the world. Every continent in the world has some pl a place, a statue, a monument, a something dedicated to George Washington. Yes, even Antarctica. I know someone's waiting to say that. There, there are the Washington Straits in Antarctica. So anywhere you go in the world, you can find them. So today, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to come on this journey. And it's going to be how, you know, here's the, here's the big sort of picture. How is Washington viewed by the world outside of America? So everyone thinks of Washington as an American figure, because he, he is. You know, Franklin, well, he's this international, you know, man of lightning and probably mystery, too. John Adams, even John Adams goes to the Netherlands in briefly France. That doesn't work out so well. Um, Jefferson, yeah, he gets credit, but Washington, he, he's American. He's, he's only even left the borders once, and he gets smallpox for his trouble. So he learned not to travel. Um, so how is Washington viewed for the world? How has Washington become a symbol of America? 
just as much as the American flag, just as much as a bald eagle, just as much as, I don't know, take your pick, whoever you like, John Wayne, I don't care. Um, and then how was he reused and repurposed by other nations, grafted onto old, their own national stories or used to explain their own history? So uh, I'm going to start with a story. And it's here. Uh, the year, it's July 3rd, 1782. It's about a year after the victory at Yorktown. Those in British Parliament are pushing for peace. They've been pushing for peace for years. This war is too costly. This war is dragging on. They've had enough of it. Meanwhile, King George III has been resistant to granting independence, to ending this war. There's a real uncertainty after Yorktown of what's going to happen. We know peace is going to come, but they don't know that. Is there going to be another campaign? Is there going to be some sort of uh, grabbing of power uh, by the American patriots? Is there going to be establishment of some sort of new American monarchy or some sort of dictatorship? No one's quite sure. Uh, Reports are coming back from British commanders that republic, a republic can't survive in America. It tends to need a monarch. So this is what's racing through. At the same time, George III feels his power is waning. Uh, he feels his, his, his ministers aren't listening to him. Uh, the prime minister at the time, Lord Rockingham, has just died two days before, and George III isn't actually told right away. He's not even told that the guy was sick. And then his choice for a replacement of prime minister is overlooked. And they're putting in, instead, the Earl of Shelburne. Now, why does it matter about the Earl of Shelburne? Because he is in favor of, of granting independence to America. He's in favor of ending the war. And George III is, feels that he's being pushed in a direction he doesn't want to go. And when he's pushed in a direction he doesn't want to go, and he's uncertain what to do, he does what we all do. He talks to his portraitist. <laughs> so, enter Benjamin West. Shown here. Benjamin West is from a Quaker family in Pennsylvania. Uh, he has a really sort of strange journey. He grows up in Pennsylvania telling, telling friends and family that he wants to be an artist and a companion to kings and emperors. The only problem is there are no kings or emperors in America. But sure enough, he proves them, he proves them all wrong, and he ends up as a court painter for George III. He's a member of the Royal Academy. His paintings actually sell for money in his own lifetime. He get, George III is his patron. But Benjamin West is also very outspoken and very pro-America. Uh, he is loyal to the king. He speaks well of the king. He perhaps loves the king. But he, he's constantly lamenting what's going on in America during the Revolution. And this is a, an earlier painting that, that, that West does. So West is going to do a number of, of different scenes and portraits uh, for the royals. So this news comes in that Rockingham, the prime minister, is dead and the Earl of Shelburne is, is coming in. And randomly, Queen Charlotte is going to call in Benjamin West to here. This is the Queen's Palace. Uh, it's also called the White House because it's painted white. And as you can imagine, Americans didn't borrow this. Um, if you're looking for it today, you won't find it. The only place you can find it is a little sundial in the British Botanical Gardens by Kew Palace. Uh, so that's where it was. And, and Benjamin West is called out. He's called from London, so he leaves his house early in the morning. He arrives, you know, sometime. The sun's just coming up. And it's strange because Queen Charlotte does not like Benjamin West. Doesn't like him one bit. He's painted her twice. 
but she doesn't trust him because of his American views. Um, but he is the sort of royal artist. He's restoring some, ch some, some chapels in Windsor. They have some brief talk about this, and then suddenly the queen invites the American artist Benjamin West into her bedchamber. And then into her closet. Benjamin West must be completely confused, as all of you are right now. Why is he, she taking him into the closet? In that closet, which is more of a drawing room, so, but the closet sounds better. In that room, slumped in a chair, is George III. West must be confused, but suddenly the king looks up and he says... Out of nowhere, what would, America, what would George Washington do if America were independent? Random, you know, conversations you just happen to make the people. So by this point, West is probably guessing that he's here for not to discuss chapel restoration, but he's here for another reason. The king often went to West when it came to American topics. He trusted West to tell him the truth. Um, West doesn't miss a beat. And he says, Washington shall retire to a private station. In that moment, lots of things flash in the king's mind. Again, speculation. I wasn't in his mind. Three months earlier, George III had actually discussed abdicating. He was going to leave the kingdom to his ne'er-do-well son, nicknamed Prinny, because he's a prince, get it? And he was going to go back to the German states. He asked Benjamin West to come with him. But he never does it. The reason he was even thinking about it is he felt he no longer had power. He wasn't, giving, he wasn't speaking against monarchy. He wasn't giving up authority. He felt he lost it. It was just a transition within, within the existing regime, the existing dynasty. He was also very interested, the king, in classical subjects. He actually would read aloud from uh, Livy's uh, text on the history of Rome. He would read that to Benjamin West. Um, and West was commissioned to do lots of sort of classical images. What would have come to his mind was the Roman Cincinnatus, who gave up dictatorial power and went home to his farm when his, his job was complete, played by Russell Crowe. <laughs> Snapping back in that moment, hearing Washington retire to a private station, the king responded, if he does that, then he shall be the greatest man in the world. Now, mind you, He's talking about Washington doing something that has not been done since the classical era. There has not been a victorious military leader who has surrendered power, surrendered authority. It hasn't happened since the classical era. So, 1782, nothing signed. There's no peace yet. Well, many are actually speculating that Americas will go, the Americans will go from King George to King George Washington. King George III is convinced it will not happen. Why? Because West told him so. And he trusts West. Shortly thereafter, the king is going to reverse his stance on, on, on independence. He's going to reluctantly assent. And West is going to set about painting this portrait in 1783. What do we see? A portrait of a marshal, George III. Uh, George III, by the way, is the first English king in history to net command troops in the field. How is he depicted? Well, as a military commander, not just any military commander, but one in armor. The loss of territory in the American Revolution was the largest since the Hundred Year War. All the trappings of military authority, a spyglass gripped in his hands, a royal cape draped over his other arm. Meanwhile, West student John Trumbull 
years later, is going to depict Washington giving up his authority, hand outstretched, giving that, that commission that gave him his authority back to Congress. And it's, the two paintings show something remarkably different, that one is trying to hold on to power that he feels is losing it, the other willingly giving it up. And it's that George III recognizes this, this, this greatness in, the, in this moment. So, let's jump back a little bit further. Where does George Washington emerge on the scene? Well, the French and Indian War. Maybe he starts it, maybe he doesn't. Depends who you listen to. Um, so what's going to happen is there's going to be a murder of a French, or surrendering French diplomat. Uh, there's, he is going to be killed by uh, one of Washington's native allies, uh, getting a nice chop to the head while he's trying to surrender, probably yelling, I am a diplomat in French. Uh, Washington doesn't speak French. He calls it uh, his defective education. Um, anyway. Um, there's Washington's going to merge on the scene. The French are going to consider this the start of the war. Label Washington as an assassin. George II is going to know Washington's name when Washington reports back about the charming sound of bullets racing through his coat, to which the king will reply, as you see. He would not say so if he'd been used to hear many. <laughs> um, Washington, though, from this sort of romanticized version of battle, his, his image is going to change very quickly. He's going to be defeated at the uh, Battle of Fort Necessity, which is basically in this little stockade fort in the middle of a field in Pennsylvania, um, showing that he's, you wouldn't put a fort in the middle of a field exposed with, surrounded by woods, but yet he does. He's 21. Give him a break. He's going to be forced to sign a uh, Articles of Comp a Capitulation, and he doesn't speak French again. It's written in French. So what does one do if you don't speak French while you call for your translator? The problem is Washington's translator is Dutch. Why would you hire a Dutch translator who doesn't speak French? Well, he had an accent, and he taught Washington fencing. So Washington's actually going to sign a document that names him as an assassin. Um, Washington's going to later claim, no, of course not. I didn't know what it said. Meanwhile, in Britain, he, it's going to be referred to as the most infamous document a British subject has ever put his hand to. This low point for Washington that's going to be saved through battle when he stops a rout of a British army under General Edward Braddock that's surprised and ambushed by French and native forces. The British press is going to report in very British fashion, he behaved remarkably well. Um, and Washington's going to emerge as this hero, sort of sur saving his reputation. What might have been, this is a 19th century portrait of Washington as, well, what he could have been. George Washington, as a young man, as a teenager, wanted to join the British Navy. His mother forbid it. George Washington, during the French and Indian War, desired nothing more than a king's commission to join the British Army. That died with Edward Braddock in a field in Pennsylvania. What might have been? Washington's going to go silent on the world scene for about 16 years. He's going to become, as we know, the father of his country. But I'm here to say he was the father of many countries. So this is actually done by a, a Portuguese artist. So the idea of Washington as a father of nations. The war breaks out, named commander-in-chief of the Continental Army. The question, though, what is he? Is he a rebel? Is he a traitor? Is he an opposite general? Do we treat him as a foe by the terms of the rules of war? Well, the Howe brothers, both a general and an admiral, aren't sure. And when they arrive in New York, in 1776, they don't actually know what to make of Washington. In fact, many are really unsure of him. Washington is sort of looked down upon. Well, he's that colonial colonel. I sort of vaguely remember his name. Didn't he kill that guy that time? Um, 
other generals are looked at as more important. Charles Lee, Horatio Gates. Why? Well, they were in the British Army. Clearly, they know their stuff. Washington's just this colonial. So in New York Harbor, letters are sent of, to, to open negotiations and dialogue. And the Howes are sort of pro, not anti-America. They're trying to bring about a peace. And they first get to send a letter. They don't know what to do, so they send it to Mr. Washington. I'm not calling him general. The letter is promptly returned by patriots with the instructions, well, no such person exists on the patriot lines. The hows think. They try again. Ah, George Washington, Esquire, etc., etc. The extra etc. is what does it. Um, Again, this letter is returned. We have no person by that name. Do you perhaps mean General Washington? So early on, it's just, there's reluctance to even recognize Washington as an equal, uh, unwilling to afford him this title. There's even a question of what on earth does this man look like? To the international community, all Americans look alike, and they all look like Ben Franklin. <laughs> But elsewhere, he starts to be compared to other individuals who embody elements of liberty and freedom. In a famous Swiss freedom fighter, William Tell, better known for getting stuff shot off his head, they're going to be compared as these heroes of old liberty. Uh, they are champions of liberty, liberty that is being usurped, that is being tarnished by uh, tyrannical rule. We're going to jump forward to, you know, obviously Washington crossing the Delaware, done by a German artist in the 19th century. So that's a whole other thing. But what we're going to come to is this, this moment is what sort of gets him respect from his British counterparts, who prior to this were referring to him as the fox to be sportingly hunted uh, throughout New Jersey. Meanwhile, Frederick the Great of Prussia, perhaps at that moment, the greatest military mind of his age, celebrated throughout the world, is going to allegedly say this was the most brilliant of any in the annals of military achievements. And this is a man that is famous for his winter campaigns when you don't fight in the winter in the 18th century. And this is someone who sort of pioneered it. And even he's saying, this guy's better than me. There's some question of how accurate this line is or if it was a later invention. I like it, so we're going to, and it's in a period source, so we're going to go with it. Meanwhile, in Britain, he's, Washington's being compared to Oliver Cromwell, the leader of the new model army who defeats the royalists, stops monarchy, but names himself Lord Protector for life. And who follows him? Well, his son. Why? Best man for the job. Uh, cancels Christmas, too. So Washington's referred to as Lord Protector Washington. By 1777, you already have the British making this connection. So even if he were to win, he's going to usurp power. He's going to be nothing more than a Cromwell. The French, meanwhile, sort of celebrate this a bit more. So there's, a, there's lots of misinformation, the idea that Washington was named dictator by, by Congress. The French are going to not say, well, you know, they're going to sort of, like, there he is. Ah, yes, very much. Le dictator. Um, and again, this is right around the time when the alliance of 1778 is forming. So again, you could, there's some speculation here. Does, what do the French think about Washington right before they become allies? Are they literally considering him to, that he's going to be some sort of more monarchical type figure? Does this help us to understand how a absolute monarch favors an anti-monarchical revolution again speculation there's also all sorts of early biographies and takes published throughout the world on who is this Washington guy there's no there's no not even a close likeness of him until about 1778 but there are all different various biographies coming out uh, that include anything from that he was born to an English aristocratic line, that he uh, started in the British Army, that he was in the cavalry, that he fought at the Battle of Culloden and killed Jacobites, possibly even James Fraser. Um, oh, 
Only one, only one chuckle at that one. Ah, never mind. Watch Outlander. It's pretty good. And why? You actually have, we know that Cornwallis is trying to turn various immigrant groups or, or non-Anglo-American groups from joining the Continental Army, Irish, Scottish. So are these early mis attempts at misinformation to get Scots in America? to not ally with the Continental uh, Army because Washington, after all, helped crush the Highlands. There are other more, if you think about the sort of fog of war. So Ambrose Seale is um, sort of an agent, a, a crown agent in the Americas and he's reporting back to the Earl of Dartmouth who is uh, sort of the secretary for the Americas. And he claims he has intelligence secret intelligence. He has a spy in Washington's family, so literally in his military, um, with his military advisors. And this is what he sends back to London. So imagine this. There is a rumor that Washington had proposed to the Congress previous to Mr. Burgoyne's affair. So that's before the, uh, Burgoyne's defeat at Saratoga. And soon after his defeat at Germantown, when Philadelphia is going to fall to the British, to rescind the Declaration of Independence that Washington is so desperate that he would give up American independence. This is the intel that's going back. So imagine you're the Earl of Dartmouth reading this, and it's a big scrawling hand. <gasps> Ready to run to the king. Maybe he does run to the king. You flip to the back of that paper, little small print, we do not believe this rumor to be true. <laughs> but you have all these different takes of not sure what to make of Washington, the idea that this is believed enough to get reported back to London. So the British don't know, understand him yet. Meanwhile, it doesn't stop some rather pointed British portrayals. So remember we talked about the Mr. Washington, George Washington Esquire? That is reported in British newspapers. And so we get this cartoon addressed to Mrs. Washington. Yes, that is George Washington in drag. Yes, he is whipping Britannia. And who is looking on? Well, a bunch of people with foreign accents. The the French, the Dutch, the Spanish, who are all speaking, in, as you can see, written out sort of um, English interpretations of what these accents would sound. And how Britain weeps. It is this my children treat me. So Washington sort of is like publicly mocked in some circles. But there are others. There are others in Britain that are celebrating and even celebrating his victories during the war, political oppositions that are using this in, in, in resistance to um, various governments. In fact, there are English publications that are sympathetic to him during the war. So this is the English magazine, you could tell because it's English. Um, he is a man of bold and liberal sentiments and more of a general than was imagined by either his friends or his enemies. This guy's actually pretty good. Whatever fortune may attend General Washington's operations, so his campaigns, or whatever use he may make of those dictatorial powers, again, the belief that, well, yeah, he, he was named a dictator by Congress, which is actually, I'm going to tell you a really funny story. Um, there was a... a a American Revolution Art Conference at the Massachusetts Historical Society about 2015 when this came up and someone said, well, George Washington was named a dictator by Congress and uh, some, someone challenged it and uh, a room full of historians were uncertain what to say to it. Um, but now you know, he was never named a dictator. But he was believed to be one, which his deluded countrymen have imprudently vested in him we cannot at present justly challenge either his abilities as a soldier or his principles as a patriot. So those people in England that believe that, yeah, he might be a dictator. Yeah, he's our enemy, but we can't speak ill of him as an individual, of his ideals. He, he holds to those, though they may differ from ours. By the end of the war, though, with victory, he's going to be celebrated throughout the world uh, for this achievement. So this is a German uh, engraving, and you're going to have uh, poems, 
written to him. Again, this one is in, in German that I translated. So the freedom of the Americas. How she fights the Hydra. Hydra, a many-headed aquatic sort of monster. Hmm, does that sound like the British Navy, perhaps? How she squirms the scaly neck and flames spray. But Hercules Washington. I, I would do a Xena theme for you, but I'm not going to. Uh, the guardian god of freedom. Now, mind you what it doesn't say here. It's not talking about Washington as an American figure. It's not talking about him as the father of America, the father of the United States. It's talking about him as a guardian god of freedom, something that extends beyond the, the United States. You'll also happen to notice that Washington looks remarkably like Frederick the Great in this, uh, this, in, this engraving. Again, at least I think so. But it's this moment, 1783, December 23rd, 1783, that's really going to seal the deal for George Washington. That is Washington giving up power. Again, that Cincinnati moment that gets recognized throughout the world. So we're going to have a... a Polish um, account from Julian Nemkiewicz, who is a poet. He's also going to become a Polish revolutionary. What? A revolutionary inspired by Washington? Surely not. He's going to say, of Washington surrendering his commission, it gave to the world a great and important example to learn. So new in the present times, or rather unknown. There was no example of this action. The Caledonian Mercury in Scotland the most distinguished character which this age has presented. In Moscow, he founded a republic which will be a haven of freedom, one banished from Europe by luxury and corruption. Washington was something more than could be found in, in Europe. Uh, in Italy, uh, 19th century historians could call him the object, object of universal elegium. So he's being celebrated in his own time for this action. And he's going to be in some ways perhaps deified, but certainly made this connection to this older classical model. So you've got, uh, uh, both of these are depictions of Washington as Cincinnatus. You'll see in this one, the sword's laying at his feet. At this one, which you could find in Washington, D.C., the sword is outstretched. Both are done by European artists. There's also this one, George Washington nude. Check out those thighs. So attempts to depict him in various classical motifs, that this is not necessarily a, an American figure, but something for the world that can, that's akin to a Greek or a Roman. And this is the common sort of education of, of the cultured 18th century uh, individual. But it's not just classical Europe. In China, he is going, he's going to be compared to esteemed figures. He's going to have the virtue of the ancient Chinese sages. The Marquis de Lafayette, his pseudo son, is going to send him the key to the Bastille during the early days of the French Revolution. Why? Because he's going to say this is a gift that a missionary of liberty to his patriarch. Washington is the patriarch of liberty of the revolutionary moments that, that spring forth, whether in the 18th century in France or in Ireland or in Poland, but later as well. So there's, there's also there's members of the Washington family that fight for Greek independence. There's even an escaped uh, um, enslaved man, Harry Washington, that goes on to lead a rebellion in Sierra Leone against the British. Depictions of Washington um, with Native Americans. There's an old legend about Washington being sort of the favorite of the gods, dating back to uh, 1755, when he does he has the bullets shot uh, through his coat, his hat bullets through his hat, horses shot out from under him. So there's this sort of native legend that even sparks around him. He's going to die. This is the apotheosis of Washington at the rotunda in, in the Capitol. You'll see he's depicted with liberty. 
it's one of the ideas that Washington gets associated with. Yeah, there are other founders. Um, they don't have the same pull internationally. Je Franklin's somewhat, but he gets overtaken by, by Washington, largely with the surrendering power, especially when he does it again as president. And so George III, when Washington surrenders power as president, is going to up his greatest man in the world to the greatest man of the age. So he gets a promotion from the king. Um, His death is going to have a major impact around the world. So in England, it's going to start a good industry. You could actually buy this fabric. It is called the Apotheosis of Franklin in Washington. Um, you can get all manner of souvenirs. You can get a milk jug with Washington's death depicted on it. Now, some of this is absolutely made for U.S. consumption. But it shows that these images are making their way around the world. You can get a George Washington surrendering his commission mantle clock in gold. Nothing says giving up power like a gold mantle clock. But again, it's this moment of giving up power, and this is, this is created again in, that, in that, that moment of the French Revolution, you know, that, that era of this building of liberty. In China, you can also get your Washington souvenirs. Uh, what you see here is a reverse glass painted portrait. So they would basically copy um, Washington portraits and, and sort of on the back of glass. You could get a Washington jug with a, a little dragon on the top. Again, a lot of this is made for U.S. consumption. But it shows how far and wide the, the name and the image of Washington is spreading. Another major way that Washington makes an impact is with his will. Uh, so Washington, uh, and, and this, is, this gets a, his will gets published internationally, and it gets re reprinted internationally because of who he is, and he knows that in his life. Uh, his will is actually kept very, is kept secret until his death. And the reason for that is in this will, he is going to f free slaves that he owns. Uh, Martha owns more slaves than he does. He is not legally allowed to free Martha's slaves because she's holding them in trust uh, through the Custis family, so for, for her late husband's um, descendants. But he's going to free them. There's going to be some provisions to it, um, but he does, does lead to the freedom and, 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 and care and education of, of slaves. Washington had taken flack for slavery and his own slave uh, ownership during his lifetime from none other than the Marquis de Lafayette. One British critic is going to, to say that uh, you claim to fight for the freedom of men. Are not your slaves men? Washington's going to think about this, but he's always reluctant, afraid of what it could do to the nation if he takes a public stand. But in his will, this gets published, and the reaction to it is it's quite surprising. Now, uh, it may not seem like this great abolitionist document because of all the provisions, but internationally, this gets used as a symbol of Washington's dedication to humanity. It is viewed as an early abolitionist document, and it adds to Washington's legacy, his, his devotion to freedom. Meanwhile, it's just hard to measure up to that guy. A poor, dejected Napoleon is going to say, it was wished that I might become Washington. Now I'm just played in a Ridley Scott movie. Simon Bolivar, liberator of South America, is going to actually own this portrait of Washington. He's going to call him the first man in the universe. Meanwhile, the future president of Ecuador, uh, Vincente uh, Rocafuerte, is going to say, let's be, let's be good persuaded that every superior manager will abuse power when they can execute it with impunity. Meaning, of course, leaders are going to abuse power unless he is a hero like Washington or like Bolivar. But Washington first. Also, Bolivar and other revolutionary figures, whether it's Jean-Jacques Dessalines, whether it's Napoleon, don't actually give up power 
and they hold dictatorial authority at various points. Meanwhile, in Japan, you get samurai George Washington, shown here defending Martha, uh, although she's not referred to as Martha. Um, also, again, going this theme, here is George Washington again, this time with bow and arrow, and here he is with the goddess of America, and there he is punching a tiger. I'd like to think that they meant a British lion. Close enough, it's a big cat. So Washington's image is going to be repurposed and reimagined to fit different national motifs. Washington himself, you see, his, is changing. In Thailand, the Thai royal family, then Siam, um, again, I could do a Broadway number that isn't Hamilton, I'm not. Um, the Prince of Siam is actually named Prince George Washington. And the nation of Thailand is going to speak of certainly Washington as a figure, but what they're going to reference is his forbearance and his tolerance. Washington famously celebrated for, for things like uh, support of religious freedom. Um, and these are ideas that carry, that carry across. The 19th century nationalist movements uh, in Italy and Germany, you have Garibaldi, the George Washington of Italy, in Hungary, Laszlo's Kossuth, the George Washington of Hungary. Um, in Budapest today, you can find a statue of George Washington. And it was put up uh, very much to mark this sort of shared inheritance. Um, this, this statue here, this is a late 19th century uh, depiction of George Washington chopping down a cherry tree. So these are, you know, these myths that are very American, that we think are as very American, these core American memories are actually transcending and they're being conveyed in art elsewhere in the world. Sometimes the image of Washington gets twisted or used slightly differently. So what we see here is Washington as a symbol of America, embracing all the new uh, conquered territories from war, from sort of imperial wars of America in the 19th century. We see Washington on a, a newspaper headline for, for seeking revenge against the Maine. Avenge the Maine, why George Washington wants you to. Statue goes up of Washington in Mexico in 1912. Two years later, it is promptly torn down. Not because he was a slave owner, but because he became a symbol of America. So it, this is torn down because uh, American military briefly occupies Veracruz. And so this Washington statue gets torn down and literally dragged through the streets uh, by cars because Washington himself again, is being repurposed, but he also stands as this sort of, this, this ultimate symbol of America. Then he wins the First World War and gets a pre-existing statue in Paris, uh, which interesting, here's some interesting trivia for you. Washington has more statues in Paris than Napoleon. Um, although American soldiers tend to steal his sword uh, during World War I. So they're, when they're stationed in France, they steal his sword. I guess it's you know, giving up the sword, um, who knows. Um, but by the 1930s, by the 1920s, this sort of interwar period, as an American-British alliance is growing, you're going to get a George Washington statue in Trafalgar Square. So think about this for a second. This would be the equivalent of America putting up a statue of an opposing nation's leader or general. So this would be um, putting up a statue of Stalin or Mussolini. Why does it go up? Uh, although there is this old line that Washington says his feet will never stand on any, any ground that is not American, so they actually put some Virginia soil on the bottom of it. Um, but it's still there today. And Washington is sort of celebrated by figures like Winston Churchill, 
who calls him one of the glories of the English-speaking race. You'll know this is the 1930s. It's almost as if tension is rising in Europe. Perhaps the British will need the Americans again. So looking to Washington as this sort of shared heritage. Um, Washington's ancestral family home in Sulgrave Manor becomes a site of ver various events. Even Queen Elizabeth II is declared a relative of George Washington, granted a very far removed one. Um, Washington is declared by a sitting British prime minister as the most English of all Englishmen. Why? Only a true Englishman could defeat England. <laughs> so the idea being that Washington's ideals are something that transcend, they're not American. The English are very much saying, well, these are traditional English trappings of liberty and freedom. And, and, and the idea of perhaps the, the George III had, had, did extend his authority and Washington, a true Englishman, upheld those values. By the bicentennial of his birthday, you could say anywhere with... Um, a circle on it is a place that held some sort of birthday celebration for him. And what you'll see is there's a number there. And the number isn't corresponding to any marker. It's the number of celebrations that were had for Washington. So for instance, you, if you look at China, you'll see that in China alone, there were 13 different celebrations of George Washington in 1932. Washington is going to be embraced by figures in, in, in Asia, just as, as he is in Europe. Um, whether it's in Chiang Kai-shek and transitions to a, a, a republic from a monarch, from, a, from the emperor, or later on by those like Mao Zedong, who is going to reinterpret Washington's ideas of hybrid warfare with a little bit of Marx. Or later on, uh, Ho Chi Minh or General Giap, who are also going to reinterpret Washington. Washington's back again for World War II with a little help from Abe Lincoln. We win. But here, depictions of Washington as a, as, as a military figure, but different. So this is a painting done by a American artist of Japanese descent, who's born right before World War II. And what he's trying to convey here is the idea of Americanness of immigrant groups, taking this, like, this penultimate American moment and grafting it on, really playing on the ideas of Japanese service during, during World War II uh, and service to, to America. So again, it's what, how do they choose to represent it? Again, going to Washington. There's lots of different depictions of Washington, too. You may remember this one from King Washington from the Assassin's Creed expansion pack. I think Assassin's Creed 3. Uh, I did not play this one. I refuse to kill Washington. Um, meanwhile, in India, uh, there's a really loose interpretation of who the dictators of the world are and, and the, the, certainly an interpretation of the world great. So we've got great dictators like Washington and Lincoln alongside Hitler and Lenin and Stalin. Um, again, so we see different manifestations, different interpretations of, of, of how the Washington is presented. So this is actually a, a poster that you would have found in Indian sort of classrooms. So imagine you're like an elementary school teacher decorating your classroom. Ah, the great dictator, George Washington. There you go. And this is from the 1950s. Uh, there are also misuses of, of Washington, uh, used for various political purposes. So you can find a George Washington of just about any nation or cause. If you're a terrorist organization, you can be a, the George Washington of a terrorist organization. Muammar Gaddafi is going to agree with that. Uh, uh, you're going to have... Uh, Jerry Adams, who's a member of the Sinn Féin group in Ireland, he's going to be Ireland's George Washington. The Soviet Union uh, in the 1970s is going to declare George Washington, according to the British, was a terrorist. Therefore, 
who is the world to judge what a terrorist actually is? Again, this, this is, and this gets picked up by um, certain individuals in the Middle East and elsewhere who say yeah, that makes perfect sense. If George Washington was a terrorist, how can we vilify this? So one of the more modern pressing questions is Washington as a slaveholder. And it's Washington owned slaves. And he's certainly in more recent years been taken to task and uh, has been asked, the, the country has been grappling how to come with this. But what's interesting is if you go back throughout the world, this isn't something that really gets focused on as much internationally. So we see that Washington is going to appear literally on official postage of uh, such former uh, slaveholding areas as Barbados, uh, areas in, in Africa, uh, in Haiti. He's going to appear on a Haitian stamp alongside Bolivar and Jean-Jacques Dessalin. Uh, the Haitian newspaper uh, Le Temps in 1932 is going to say, Washington prepared the way for Lincoln, going to this idea of emancipation from his will, the idea of liberty. Uh, in, again, 1932, uh, Liberia, a uh, former uh, colony for former slaves, is going to declare that if there had not been a George Washington, there may not be a Liberia. So the idea of the resistance to Washington as a slaveholder is much more modern, uh, largely 1990s and later, and very much American, although it does start to take uh, a bit of prominence at a few key moments. Uh, during the American Civil War, you do see some uh, international discussion of, is Washington an American? Is he a Southerner? Would he have been a Confederate? Um, but by and large, and so my wife tells me I have to dig up the dirt on Washington. Like she, she's hoping I'd find like an illegitimate kid or, or any other number. She's like, go find it. And I'm telling you so far, I haven't found a lot. Most of the negative stuff about Washington comes out during, um, around about 1793 with the proclamation of neutrality where American decides we're going to be neutral and not support the French against the world. Um, and the French are very vocal about that. There's again some again during uh, the American Civil War when there's sort of the Confederates are trying to claim Washington, the Americans are trying to claim Washington. And then there's a bit more in the 1990s uh, that very much follows on the heels of sort of similar questions of um, to go with uh, Tom, along with someone like Thomas Jefferson, there's like uh, the question of rape or, or slave children or things of that sort. But by the 1970s, George Washington is so well regarded internationally, he actually appears on British money alongside the Queen. But is Washington a traitor? This is the looming question. And in the 1990s, the British Inns of Court, so that's the equivalent of their law school, is going to decide to finally test, put this question to rest, and they're going to put George Washington on trial for treason in London. And he's going to be found not guilty. The most English of all Englishmen standing up to tyranny, standing up for freedom. He's so well regarded that he's both acquitted of treason and also declared to be Britain's greatest enemy of all time. Greater threat than Napoleon, a greater threat than Hitler. Why? Because Washington beat them. So, going back to 1783, George III called him the greatest man in the world. Whether or not you agree he's the greatest man in the world, he certainly made his way around the world. And you have a famous poet in the 1780s saying that by the night, in the 1780s saying that the world knows your name. The world knows the name of Washington. By the 19th century, it was true. So, thank you. Thank
I just. You know. Yeah, well, thank you so much. Uh, that was so interesting uh, and in enjoyable and, and provocative. Lots of great stuff. So I'd love to take some questions. Uh, just go ahead and raise your hand for me, and uh, just I'll bring the microphone over to you so we can pick it up for the recording. Thank you. So you mentioned uh, that his will was seen as a pro uh, proto-abolitionist mm -hmm. work, and do you have any recommendations or specific literature that or on his work or co considerations concerning abolitionism during his work his life okay so uh the question of washington and abolitionism is an is a complicated one because abolitionism may not even be the right word um towards the later portions of his life he became anti-slavery but he doesn't take action and this is this is what is going to sort of get the Marquis de Lafayette to say, you know, listen, you, you don't want to be taken as a hypocrite here. You have to do something. And privately, he's going to say, yes, I, I, I agree. So, you know, slavery is wrong. I want to end this. But he's not sure how to do it. And here's a couple of things why. And some of it's, you know, he's afraid of what will happen if he speaks out. Again, maybe this is a cop-out, maybe, right? Maybe this is the dereliction of leadership. But he's afraid of what's going to happen. He's literally afraid that there could be a civil war over this issue. Not really that wrong. You know, it happens pretty soon after. He's afraid what will happen if a figure like him speaks out on it. He's actually going to say in private that if their civil war was to come, he would side with the North. Um, but he, there's this... The earliest references are perhaps uh, maybe as early as 1775, what he's, uh, so initially he doesn't want any African Americans free, enslaved at all to serve in the Continental Army, and he's really resistant. But he starts to get reports of various African Americans who had served, because uh, the Continental Army was the first integrated army, uh, and it was also the only integrated American army until after World War II. And there's going to be various lines that he's going to say he wishes to uh, uh, get quit of, of, of slavery. Um, so it's really, it's about interpretation here. And it's harder to give definitive answer. The best book on this, uh, Mary Thompson um, wrote a book called The Only S Unavoidable Subject of Regret. If you read one book on Washington and slavery, it's that one. Um, so the question is, is he an outspoken abolitionist? No. Is he an outspoken even on anti-slavery? No. Does, is he privately reading anti-slavery texts? Yes. Uh, the one thing why the will is so important is he is one of the very few founders and certainly one of the very few slaveholding founders to actually do anything tangible about slavery. That's why it gets picked up internationally. So today, uh, there's lots of like, oh, well, Washington uh, did that because he no longer needed his slaves. He was thinking about his, his reputation. And, and, and those things are not necessarily false. They could very well be true. But the idea, the reception internationally was about taking it as this anti-slavery document. Uh, and this is the most shocking and most uh, shocking part of this will because the rest of it is like, to my nephew Bushrod, you shall have the spoons. Um, you know, it's, it's this sort of thing that really sparks the international imagination. Thanks, Craig. That was really interesting. So with Washington's abdication of power, first mm -hmm. as a general and then as the president, does he give reasons why he does that? I mean, like, you, of course, internationally or even in America, we think of these great principles. But mm -hmm. was, this, was this a principled stance he was taking, or was it more like, well, I'm just a homebody, or I don't think I was very good as president, and I just have these more material concerns? Okay, so there, he is always trying to get home. Uh, he, during the war, he only makes it to Mount Vernon, I think, twice. He briefly stops by on the way down to Yorktown. Um, and then he makes it um, right after, so he resigns. So he's there very, again, I'm not, I'm not counting how many, I'm not, I don't have him on my ring camera. Uh, but he's, he's home very frequently. He always wants to get home. Um, he is concerned about his reputation. He is, he is aware that, you know, as, as one musical said, history has its eyes on you. Um, but I think there's something more to that. He knows about this classical motif, right? He knows about Cincinnatus. Um, 
his favorite sort of play is Cato about the sacrifice for the Republic. At the same time, he knows that people actually are discussing that he could seize power. Uh, Louis Nicola, who is an Irish-born Continental Army member, you know, joins the Continental Army, actually at one point floats the idea, maybe it wouldn't be such a bad idea if you named yourself king. Washington's aware of this, and he's aware that this is the common practice for a successful military leader in, 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 the recent, in recent, even up through ancient history. Uh, so he's very much determined to not do that. This is why I would say this is um, not just empty rhetoric. If you go back, there's a moment, uh, and we talked about this at lunch earlier, the Newburgh conspiracy, when you have his officers are actually potentially contemplating mutiny, marching against Congress. They hadn't been paid ever. Um, or retreating, letting the British march out of New York and do what they wanted, and Washington is going to stop them with the clever use of glasses by saying, I've grown blind in your service, but also he brings them back to that document on the red carpet thing here, the Declaration of Independence, by telling them to remember their sacred honor as you've pledged your sacred honor. So I think it's more about the ideals here. Um, he obviously comes back, and Washington's the master of, I don't want the job, no, I must. <laughs> he absolutely is. He dresses, he puts on his military uniform in the Continental Congress. He absolutely wants these jobs. Um, but there's a principledness behind it uh, that isn't, if he was just out for power, he could have had it. He didn't. Um, I wonder if, if there's a correlation between the reputation of the United States internationally and the reputation of George Washington internationally. Um, so you used a lot of a lot of examples, but I noticed, and there weren't a lot of, maybe not a lot of examples from say after 1945. Um, I wonder if, if in your research you found that there is a, a sort of a uh, I'll, I'll just say a correlation between there, the reputation of the United States and George Washington. There, no, there absolutely is. Um, so Washington is used to be a, uh, as in many ways, as a, I, he sets a precedent in a lot of ways, right? So the precedent of giving up power. That's something that gets used universally. So we see it, um, uh, the, the 1980s, you have uh, President Korea, who actually took power through a coup, is going to claim that, well, I want to be Korea's George Washington. Uh, he says it to Ronald Reagan, trying to sort of curry favor with Reagan, and um, Reagan doesn't respond, just sort of like walks away, you know. Um, you do have him used as a sort of precedent, like, is this devotion to nation, is this grasp for power, but at the same time, he is used as a symbol of America. So the high watermarks of Washington are going to appear um, when you have various nations have a sort of rebellion or nationalist movement. He sort of pops up there as um, not necessarily a, a, a symbol, but as a prototype for that nation. Um, you also see him internationally in these moments around the world wars as a joint sort of symbol of alliance between Britain and America. Um, and you also see that you know, in France, depictions of Washington in, in Paris and depictions of Washington alongside Lafayette, even though Lafayette doesn't necessarily have the best sort of you know, reputation. So yes, there absolutely is a linkage to how the U.S. is, is perceived. So for instance, all those nations throughout the world that are celebrating Washington in 1932, the one do, does not Soviet Union because of how Washington is perceived there. So yes, that absolutely goes, goes hand in hand. Um, you could, it doesn't mean Washington still can't be used, reinterpreted for your own purposes, but there is, yes, that absolute connection that uh, as, as, as America goes, so, so goes Washington. Um, but it also can be that in a lot of ways, um, it's also viewed as America failing Washington. So for instance, during the Mexican-American War, just one off the top of my head, um, Mexicans are speaking about the Americans 
who are going into, you know, invading Mexico as failing Washington's principles. This is a man who fought for liberty. What are you doing? So, again, make him whatever you want. <clears throat> um, utterly fascinating, by the way. Oh, thank um, you. I just wanted to say, you, you were talking about how a lot of these sort of different national revolutionary movements, you know, would sort of ad adopt Washington. I guess I'm just curious, like, did like in terms of Washington, like because you know he's, he's you know he's this you know rich landowner, and I guess I'm sort of wondering mm -hmm. like were there any sort of revolutionary s sort of circumstances where they w they didn't sort of see him as sort of one of their own, but like they might be more drawn to like other sort of American revolutionaries who weren't you know. No, that's that's a, that's a great question, and I yes, there are other figures uh, again. If we're talking American revolutionaries, yes, Franklin's another one that pops up a lot. Uh, the, the others, not so much, uh, Adams, you know, John Adams, I know him, you know, that whole bit. Um, Adams, not so much. Jefferson, yes. Jefferson pops up a lot as well because of the Declaration of Independence um, and how that gets repurposed. So, you know, think, think about like the, um, you know, Vietnamese Declaration of Independence, which is basically cut and paste Thomas Jefferson. Um, so Jefferson appears too, but Washington is the one that really sort of sticks out and gets the, the statues, gets the monuments, gets, you don't hear about the Ben Franklin of Ireland or the Thomas Jefferson of Germany, but you hear about the George Washington. So he sort of comes to the prominence, I think it's because, a couple of reasons, uh, military leader, People like military history, you know, that's why the History Channel exists. Um, because he becomes president, and I think it's the giving up power that really sticks with people. Because you're right, he's a rich landowner. He's one of the few, few founders that doesn't die sort of impoverished. Um, but it's that giving up power that really sort of makes him, he's, that he's not a hypocrite, he's not, it's not some empty rhetoric, he actually believes what he fought for. Whereas you could say, well, Jeff, Jefferson, he's got these high ideas, does he live it? Um, Franklin, in a lot of ways, un, you know, unfortunate for his reputation, he dies right as the nation is, you know, the Constitution is being created. Uh, he gets an uptick with his autobiography. Um, but his sort of fame was earlier. Um, so it's Washington that really takes, takes hold. And then what's interesting is you have revolutions, Marxist revolutions that are anti, you know, completely the opposite of, of the sort of Washingtonian principles. But he's viewed as, 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 as in a positive light, but just reinterpreted, right? Um, so he could be whatever you want him to be. All right, well, uh, thank you everyone for coming. If you enjoyed this event, um, just remember you can always, uh, you'll find other events like this coming up. Uh, you can just go to www.independence.olmiss.edu. Uh, uh, .ol you can follow the Declaration Center on our Instagram account. We now have a YouTube channel. Um, and you can always just send us uh, an email uh, at freedom at olmiss.edu, and we'd be happy to put you all on our email list. So anyway, with that, uh, thank you all for being here, and let's give Dr. Smith a, a warm round of applause. Thank you so much. <laughs>